So we're going to be talking today mainly about uh, the free energy principle. And I thought perhaps we could begin with its origins. You know, I'm, I'm interested to know, did it come to you as a kind of moment of sudden insight or was it a gradual process of refining the ideas? It was very much a, a, an incremental process of refining the ideas. Uh, um, the, I mean, the intuitions I think we all have um, and certainly the sort of the fundaments of what one, what one would like to explain were in place, you know, I would imagine when I was in, in, you know, in my um, adolescence, but there's been a long journey of formalizing those ideas and finding the right calculus, the right maths, the right sort of constructs and ideas out there in many different fields, but specifically in, in sort of maths and physics that um, lent a, crisp, a crispness to the ideas um, of the sort that you would be able to, you know, articulate the ideas um, to the um, academic literature uh, and also um, provide proof of principles, you know, either mathematically or through numerical analysis. So that's taken many, many years. Uh, I think I'm now, I'm now over 60, so it's take, taken many decades to get there. <laughs> and then in your kind of uh, career as a neuroscientist, did it start as a, an explicit attempt to kind of as a neuroscientific theory, a theory for the brain, and then you realized it's kind of wider applicability? Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, and in fact, even more pragmatic than that. So, you know, that, that calculus, the, the, you know, the mathematics that underwrites uh, the free energy uh, principle um, actually inherits from having to contend with the problems faced by any sentient being um, as a... Um, a neuroscientist trying to analyze um, neurobiological time series, in particular sort of imaging neuro time series. So exactly the same problems confront you when you're trying to infer the hidden causes of your brain imaging data or your electroencephalographic data uh, that present themselves to you and me when we're trying to make sense of our visual data and, and all the other um, auditory and interceptive streams. So um, the, you know, I had to become fluent in um, inference and making the most of data, uh, sense making in a very practical uh, context. Um, and then it was an easy move to say, well, perhaps the brain is also solving the problems in this principled mathematical way. Uh, indeed, um, all the empirical evidence speaks to the brain and its functional architectures as essentially um, you know, being being a little scientist doing exactly what we were doing. So, you know, that that um, more than just um, is this a theory of how the brain works, um, it, it actually inherits um, from um, the practical um, application of mathematical ideas to, to working out how the brain works, looking at um, empirical data from the brain. But certainly the the underlying ideas were, were, were originally um, more generic. It was you know, trying to solve the problem of um, self-organization and, and sort of the existential imperatives for things that we see around us. And, and of course, the most interesting thing is, is me. So, 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 so clearly me and my brain were sort of top of the list in terms of ex explanatory targets. But um, from a maths point of view, the, 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 there is certainly something special about the brain, but it, you know, the fundaments have to have to have to be um, translate to any domain of self organization. So um, there has been an effort in the past um, decade um, and more so over the past five years just to say, well, look, you know, the brain is a beautiful example, a fantastic organ, but the principles by which it operates sh are shared by any fantastic creature or structure, you know, from a virus to a vegan. Yeah, I mean, that's a great correspondence that you had in your day to day work, because, you know, everything we're going to be talking about is kind of relevant to the Bayesian brain hypothesis, right? This kind of, and for, you know, it's good for people to keep in mind this idea of the brain being kind of hidden in the skull, and it needs to be doing this kind of hypothesis testing, right? As you say, it's like a little scientist taking clues from the senses and building hypotheses, predictions, models of what's going on in, in the wider world. No, absolutely. That, that, that was beautifully put. Yeah, that's exactly what that's exactly what the theology principle says. Yes. Right. So, would it be possible to try and give a kind of uh, a summary of the free energy principle, and then we can unpack it in, in more detail? 
Yes, of course. Um, so when asked to do this, I usually ask um, whether you would like um, the sort of the high road story or the low road story. So you know, there, I think there are two routes to um, an intuition behind the, um, the basic idea. You can either take a sort of low road, which is a bottom up road and sort of um, start from the ideas of the students of Plato through to Kant and see how they unfolded in the 20th century in terms of ideas like analysis by synthesis, uh, epistemological automata, perceptions, hypothesis, testing, right through to modern day uh, machine learning, deep learning, um, and nods from um, that community, the machine learning community, uh, from people like um, Jeffrey Hinton and Peter Diane to the neurosciences and to brain in, in the sense of things like the Helmholtz machine. Helmholtz being a very key figure in that, in that pedigree, in that legacy of thinking where it's all about effectively, just as you've said, uh, the brain as a scientist, trying to make sense of data by forming fantasies, beliefs, hypotheses that best explain the data at hand. And then the data now become, um, or the senses, the sensorium is now just in the service of either confirming or disconfirming a particular belief about states of affairs out there beyond the, uh, the sensory veil or, 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 or beyond, beyond the skull. The skull. Um, so that, um, that story has, has been given a, a, you know, a, 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 an important twist. Um, it's, that twist has always been there um, so, you know, from the days of things in engineering such as cybernetics and Ross, Ross Ashby. Um, it's been there from the point of view of ethology uh, in terms of Gibsonian affordances. But the, the twist I'm talking about is an enacted turn, a, pra a, you know, a very a pragmatic turn at the beginning of this century, uh, where people were more focused on um, the situated aspects of that inference. So it's not, it's not just about um, extracting information from sensory data. It's not a sort of inside, um, outside in process. It's much more of a, an outside, sorry, an, out, an inside out process where you're in charge of soliciting the data that you need to confirm or disconfirm your hypotheses. So that um, that's that that in, inactive uh, part is um, um, reflected in things like the four E's, you know, extended, embedded. Um, um, and I always forget the other, one of the three, so I won't attempt the full four, but um, the, um, you know, embodied um, and extended. Um, so very much coming back to this sort of meme as the brain as a little scientist, you know, you think about what the scientist does. I mean, he, he actually spends a very, very small amount of, um, of her time uh, analyzing the data, but much more time designing the experiments so that would suggest that we're talking about um, an inference process, you know, fully described, I think, in the writings of people like um, Helmholtz and Richard Gregory, um, you know, perceptions, hypothesis, testing. But on top of that, there's the, um, the, um, all the machinery that prescribes those principles by which we go and solicit and garner the right kind of data in exactly the same way that a scientist would spend most of their time writing research proposals, thinking about the experimental design, getting that experimental design exquisitely correct so that the data that is disclosed by that paradigm has the greatest power in terms of disambiguating between this hypothesis and another hypothesis, usually the alternate hypothesis and another hypothesis. So that, that takes inference and the brain is a fantastic organ, a, you know, a purveyor of fantasies, hypotheses um, to, a, to, a, to a, a new level. So it's now not just about making sense of the data, it's really, you know, how would I go and solicit, how would I palpate the world in many, many different ways, whether it's uh, attending to different gut feelings, whether it's literally uh, palpating my fingers or moving my eyes, visual palpation, all of this has to be now uh, understood in the service of optimizing inference in the same way you have to understand how a scientist works in terms of designing the right kind of disambiguating experiments. So what we are talking about is basically action. So you know, hence active inference being the sort of teleological corollary of, of, uh, of the free energy principle.